and at given hours fit to view the priceless art treasures of the past. But at all hours, the leaders of the Soviet Union and its Communist Party drive through these gates to their offices. Tsarist rule. This is the Kremlin, museum and symbol, where through the areas permitted to our cameras, we shall see more. Although the Soviet power was seized in the name of the people, for many welcome inside the walls. But now, on an ordinary day, the public is permitted to visit some parts of the Kremlin. The past and the present of Moscow's Kremlin are focused here in the Grand Kremlin Palace, constructed a century ago under Nicholas I to replace one built for the Empress Elizabeth. Our host is an honored officer of the Red Army, the Commandant of the Kremlin, Lieutenant General Andrei Yakovlevich Vidyanin. Welcome to the Kremlin. Thank you. Очень рад, что мне предоставилась возможность показать вам Кремль. General Vidyanin tells us that we shall relive the story of Russia as he guides us through these historic halls. Депутаты Верховного Совета Союза, послы. This is the staircase of honor for important guests for the celebrations of state. When there are heroes to praise, they are greeted here, as were the two young cosmonauts, Nikolaev and Popovich. <laughs> Musicians on that occasion played Glinka's glory, glory to the Russian people. The most lavish of Kremlin celebrations are staged in this great hall, named for St. George, the patron of Moscow, and for the military order of the Tsars established in his name. It becomes a banquet hall, tables laden with food and drink, the heady atmosphere of power and success. The latter-day Romanovs danced here. The present leaders proposed toasts to the ultimate victory of communism. These apartments were made for Romanov monarchs who spent most of their time in Petersburg, only occasionally visiting Moscow. The Soviet regime uses them for small receptions. Here too is held the ceremony in which a new ambassador presents his letter of credence to the Soviet government. Traditionally, all the officers of an embassy accompany their ambassador on this occasion, as when Ambassador Foy D. Kohler took up his duties for the United States in Moscow. We'll encounter the sympathetic cooperation of your Excellency and of the other officials of the government of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. <laughs> The Grand Kremlin Palace was conceived as a unity to blend the newer with the more ancient Kremlin. The Tsars lived in a profusion of palaces, interconnected by galleries and passageways. And the best that remains is called the Terems Palace. In the Terems and the even more ancient chapels and halls that adjoin it, we can feel the presence of the terrible Ivan, the first Romanov, Michael. The young Peter, who grew up to hate the Kremlin and eventually built the new capital of Petersburg to get away from it. General Vedenin is proud of the labor of the new regime to preserve these authentic precincts of the old. <coughs> Side by side with the oldest area of the Kremlin stands the newest, an architectural leap from the past to the glass and steel of today.
the new Soviet Palace of Congresses. The new palace has brought public life into the Kremlin on a large scale. It is used regularly for concerts, opera, and ballet performances. A portion of the Bolshoi Theater's season has been transferred to the new palace with its enormous audience capacity. The buffet, offering caviar and champagne as well as less exotic refreshment, is on the top floor overlooking the city and its Kremlin. To the big stage in the auditorium below are brought many important foreign artists, as well as Soviet companies staging traditional Russian classics, such as Mikhail Glinka's opera, A Life for the Tsar. Since its unveiling, the Palace of Congresses has stood like a stranger among its neighboring towers and buildings. But it has one thing in common with them. Western artisans helped to fashion it. These cannon, which decorate the Kremlin's arsenal building, include many abandoned by Napoleon as he retreated, following the hollow triumph of his occupation of the Kremlin. The arms in this arsenal were a major target of Moscow workers during the Bolshevik Revolution. General Videnin's Kremlin command is quartered here. The shells for this Kremlin curiosity weigh two tons each. The 16th century Tsar cannon never was fired. A companion piece, the 18th century Tsar bell, never rang. But it has a story to tell us. The story of great fires which repeatedly swept the Kremlin destroying all but the most durable structures. The intense heat from one such fire cracked the Tsar bell before it could be properly mounted. The cathedrals here on Cathedral Square are the oldest surviving buildings. They were the places of coronation and of burial. The Kremlin was all seat of power. The faith which these churches, now museums, represent is officially discouraged but the atheistic state preserves and restores them as treasures of art and history. The Annunciation was the Tsar's family cathedral. When attacking armies began to use artillery, General Videnin explains to us, the wooden Kremlin walls were replaced by these battlements of brick. They have stood for five centuries, sometimes resisting attack, sometimes not. The ornamental spires and tent-shaped roofs on the towers were added when the rulers mistakenly thought themselves secure. The Bolsheviks, the last to storm and capture the Kremlin, repaired the Spassky clock, tore down the structures they didn't like, and restored the rest. These walls, with their 20 individual towers, enclose a triangle of more than 65 acres with government buildings, palaces, churches, monuments. This is not Russia's only Kremlin. It is the Moscow Kremlin. It is the Kremlin that in almost every age of Russia's history has reflected the character and symbolized the power of Russia's rulers. Three hundred years before the birth of Columbus, a line of minor Russian princes took over a small settlement on a hill overlooking the Moscow River. There they built a fortress, a Kremlin, with a rough wooden wall. The timber of the wall had hardly aged when it was attacked by Tatars from the east. The Tatar Golden Horde, Asiatic warlords, burned Moscow to the ground. The Moscow princes, to save themselves, bowed to the invaders. They became vassals of the heirs of Genghis Khan. Moscow's crafty rulers emerged rich and strong in the role of tax collectors to the Golden Horde, 
paying them tribute in slaves and gold. A new Kremlin, protected this time by a wall of white stone, became their citadel. Drawn by the strength of this stone wall, leaders of Eastern Christianity moved to Moscow. They brought guidance and the power of their blessing for their rulers. In time, these princes of Moscovy grew to resist Tartar demands. Again and again, their city was attacked. During more than two centuries, battles were fought at the war. At last, Moscow defeated the Tartars. The Moscow princes were sovereign. They were to emulate the Tartar idea of the absolute all-powerful ruler. A prince known to history as Ivan the Great was one of Moscow's first rulers to see far beyond the Kremlin walls. He took as his emblem the two-headed eagle of Byzantium. This symbol of power and prestige became the crest of the Kremlin. Under it, Ivan dreamed of consolidating a Moscovite empire and of making Moscow the new center of Eastern Christianity. To help him create a capital scaled to his vision of glory, he brought to Moscow's Kremlin master builders and artisans from Renaissance Italy. In 1491, the Palace of Faces or Facets was completed. great hall, Ivan's throne was installed amidst the elaborate ritual, the pomp of a new court. Special openings were built in the wall so that women, barred from much of court life, could watch the proceedings below. Ivan's ordered splendor, a sharp break with a somber past, proclaimed a new era for the Kremlin. Three great cathedrals were built. The Annunciation, designed by Russians, but showing the influence of Italy. In its windows, open to the sun, and in the soft, luminous glow of the interior, where court marriages and christenings were celebrated. Cathedral of the Archangel. Here was consecrated the burial ground of the Kremlin's princes and later of its dars, watched over by holy icons. The Uspensky, the Cathedral of the Assumption, was Ivan's most extravagant effort to build a city of greater glory than Constantinople, to make of the Moscow Kremlin his third Rome. Here, where all the Tsars were to be crowned, every detail proclaims the glory of Ivan's vision. The frescoed figures, the sculpted altars and thrones, Madonnas and saints, the panels of beaten silver overlaid with gold and precious stones, all these to proclaim, there is nothing above Moscow but the Kremlin, and nothing above the Kremlin but heaven itself. The icon of St. George, patron saint of Russian armies, painted eight centuries ago. The Virgin of Kazan, 
said to be an icon of miraculous powers. The Christ of the Fiery Eye, carried into battle by Muscovite soldiers. Another of Prince Ivan the Great's most lasting gifts to his heirs was a massive wall of red brick that still girdles the Kremlin today. It was another, later Ivan, who took for himself and his successors the title of Tsar from the Roman Caesar. Ivan IV, better known as Ivan the Terrible, a despot and a religious fanatic. He ordered a church built to celebrate a military victory. The Cathedral of St. Basil the Blessed in Red Square, just outside the Kremlin Wall. Tsar Ivan, the legend goes, was pleased with this monument to his faith. So pleased that he had its architect's eyes put out to keep him ever from creating anything of equal beauty. Life at court was frequently an orgy of lust and drunkenness, interspersed at the Tsar's whim with prayer and bell ringing. Ivan sometimes secluded himself for days in devout meditation. Here he prayed in the Cathedral of the Assumption. But the search for salvation did not keep him from ordering the assassination of the enemies he felt himself surrounded with. Although Ivan was spared excommunication, his presence in the Kremlin cloisters was ruled as sacrilege. The churches where he had prayed, which he had supported and embellished, closed their doors to him. Haunted by fears of eternal damnation, Ivan built a special gallery on the outside of the Annunciation Cathedral. In it, he prayed, alone. An icon shows the Tsar brooding on his sins, sins that he was to expiate tragically within his own lifetime. It came to pass that Ivan criticized for being too revealing in her dress the young wife of his eldest son, the sun came to her defense. The Tsar's native passion flared. The tone grew in violence. Ivan, blind now with rage, raised his steel-tipped staff and struck. The Tsar's heir apparent, his first and favorite son, died in the arms of his horrified father. Ivan never recovered from the blow he himself had dealt. In less than two years, he joined his son in death. Here in the Archangel Cathedral is Ivan's tomb. Beside him, two of his sons, the one he killed, and another, who became the next Tsar. Missing is a third son, Dimitri, who died mysteriously to the child. Dimitri's strange disappearance, he was rumored to have been murdered, was to bring about a struggle for power for this throne in the Kremlin. In time, a clever nobleman Boris Godunov gained the throne. Tsar Boris built and also to stop rumors that he had been responsible for the death of Dmitri. At the time, the people of Russia were suffering from a severe famine. Superstitious and ignorant, they saw in this calamity the finger of God pointed against Boris Godunov. Then there were new rumors. Ivan the Terrible's last son, Prince Dmitri, was alive. 
had escaped death miraculously. This, his tomb, was empty, the rumors said. Legend has it that Dimitri had risen from the grave to hound Tsar Boris Godunov. The Tsar imagined he was seeing the murdered prince in his Kremlin apartments. suddenly, some say, by his own hand. Two months after Boris died, the throne in the Palace of Facets was usurped by the man he had feared mostly, the pretender brought to Moscow by Polish arms. To the Kremlin, that ancient seat of Russian orthodoxy, he brought his following of Polish advisors. Soon, Moscow was rumbling with discontent. Dmitri's Polish wife spurned the Russian Orthodox faith. Dmitri's foreign supporters were his undoing. The mob stormed the palace, killed Dimitri, placed his remains in a cannon, and fired them back toward Poland. Through the gates of the Kremlin where they dwelt, came little of the currents of Renaissance and Reformation, which had long been sweeping Western Europe. Their palace, remote within the Kremlin, was a symbol of the country's isolation from Western enlightenment. The Tsars, absolute rulers, suspicious of everything, trusting no one, lived here in fear of their lives. Outside the walls, Russia was slumbering in ignorance, in poverty, and serfdom. It was to be shaken out of its torpor by a new crisis in the Kremlin, the perennial struggle for the throne. The authority of the double eagle was divided among three rulers. On the double throne of this collective leadership sat two crown czars. Behind the throne, an invisible power. The crowns belonged to a 10-year-old boy named Peter and his half-brother Ivan. Ivan's ambitious older sister, Sofia, had herself made regent and whispered instructions to the two boys through an opening behind the throne. Sophia saw Peter as a threat. She incited the palace guard to riot against the faction that supported Peter. Before young Peter's eyes, members of his own family and friends were hacked to pieces, their bodies flung from the windows. Peter and his mother were sent in a carriage to a village outside Moscow, to a new life. For the next seven years, the young Tsar was the object of Sofia's intrigue. Peter's main interest was soldiering. He created his own military units, platoons and companies. His soldiers trained to rigorous standards and used the... 
the palace guards attempted another seizure of power for Sofia, Peter himself and his troops tortured and hanged them by the thousands. Their corpses were left to rot, hanging from the battlements overlooking Red Square. A warning against further dissidents. As the 17th century ended, Peter was absolute master of the Kremlin. But in the atmosphere of its palaces, he found gloom. The Terem Palace reminded him of the brutal events of his childhood. The Tsar had breathed the intoxicating air of Western Europe. The encircling wall of the Kremlin began to suffocate him. The nearly seven foot tall Tsar, who would be remembered as Peter the Great, made a bold decision. Boasting that he had taken Russia from non-existence to existence, he abandoned Moscow and its Kremlin. On the Baltic, the waterway to Europe, he founded a new capital to be known as St. Petersburg and turned Russia toward a new destiny in the West. In 1812, Napoleon brought the West to Russia in his own way. His troops captured Moscow and occupied the Kremlin without a struggle. Most of the population had fled the advancing French army. The Tsar's palace in the Kremlin became Napoleon's quarters. The next day, Moscow was in flames. Four days and nights, the fires raged. Two-thirds of the city was destroyed. The French took harsh reprisals against arsonists and looters. At the same time, their own troops plundered the riches of the Kremlin. For five weeks, Napoleon awaited the Russian surrender. Parting gesture, Napoleon gave orders to blow up the Kremlin, but the attempt failed. Soon, the French retreat was swallowed by the Russian winter. Of the 600,000 men of Napoleon's Grand Army who had marched into Russia, more than half were to die in the snow. left by the retreating French, were hauled back to the Kremlin and ranged along the wall of its arsenal. The candelabrum was made for the Uspensi Cathedral, made from gold and silver, looted by the French, only to be abandoned in the snow. stolen from the Kremlin bell tower was recovered and replaced. Russia was victorious. For a century after the defeat of Napoleon, the Kremlin fell into disuse and disrepair. But the solemn tokens of Russia's grandeur behind the Kremlin walls were not forgotten. Here to the Archangel Cathedral the Tsars came to pay their respects to their ancestors in this holiest of Kremlin cathedrals. Watched over by the 15th century icon of the Archangel Michael were the tombs of Russian princes and Tsars. The founder of Moscow to the predecessor of Peter the Great. 
a chronicle of the Russian monarchy. Uspensky Cathedral, the Cathedral of the Assumption, every Tsar came to be crowned. The long, solemn procession entered the cathedral behind the traditional censors. Behind the members of the imperial family came four. was a traditional path to the throne, a legacy of centuries. The ivory throne of Ivan III and Ivan the Terrible. The throne of rubies, turquoise and pearls of Boris Godunov. The throne of Alexis Romanov, studded with 876 diamonds. Kazan, Astrakhan, Georgia, Siberia, proclaiming a new emperor and czar of all the Russias. Nicholas II, last Romanov to rule, was crowned Tsar and Emperor in 1894. Nicholas reigned from St. Petersburg, but he maintained sumptuous apartments in the Grand Kremlin Palace for those occasions when the imperial family were in Moscow. During such visits, the Kremlin came to life again Gala receptions were held in the presence of courtiers, ladies-in-waiting, and moustached, high-booted officers of the elegant imperial guards. At times, the Tsar retired to this study to meditate.
with meditation did not meet the needs of the country. Russia's new middle class led a revolution. After three years of war and suffering, the myth of Tsar's power collapsed and the long reign of the Tsars came to an end. A new regime spread to Moscow and the Kremlin. In the wake of the upheaval, Bolshevik Red Guards gained ascendancy over liberal revolutionaries. They stormed the gates, broke into the war citadel, captured the Kremlin. Civil war was to rage for four years. Moscow was declared the capital. Inside the Kremlin, the hammer and sickle replaced the double eagle of the Tsars. The red flag flew on top of the old Senate building, eventually to be known as Sverdlov Hall. Here, under this dome, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was to hold its meetings. After a break of more than two centuries, the Kremlin once again became the symbol of Russia's destiny under the government of the Soviets, headed by a schoolteacher's son named Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. When the Red Star replaced the Byzantine double eagle on the Spassky Tower, the Savior's Tower, the symbol was clear for all of Russia. Today's Kremlin serves the leaders of the Communist Party and the government, and General Videnin will show us where they worked. This building was designed for the Senate, which Peter the Great had created as a leading organism of government. Today, it is the Council of Ministers building, if we were on our way to see the chairman of the Council of Ministers, we would take this staircase to his office. Mr. Nikita Khrushchev's predecessors had their offices here. Mr. Bulganin, Mr. Malenkov, Mr. Stalin, and the predecessor of them all, Mr. Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, known as Lenin. Within six months after the Bolshevik seizure of power in Petrograd, Lenin was living and working here in the Kremlin. His small apartment was just a few steps from his office down the hall and reflects the austerity on which Lenin insisted in his personal life. The work of inventing his new form of government, step by step as he went along, absorbed him far into every night, and he seldom left this wing of his Kremlin headquarters. With him here, his wife lived simply for the use of the power they had won to forge the Soviet state was luxury enough for Lenin and Krupskaya. Lenin's last writings were dictated from his bed in the Kremlin as disease slowly ate away his strength. When he was active, Lenin's days and nights were mostly spent in his office. He studied maps extensively, especially during the precarious days of the Civil War. The small office, with its homely furnishings, had an atmosphere to which Lenin was deeply attached. Here he studied, wrote, made decisions, conferred with visitors and comrades. The calendar remains open to the date of his last working day in this office, and even that day ended only at 8.15 in the evening. Lenin and his commissars, Stalin, Trotsky, Dzerzhinsky and the others, met frequently, usually at night, in a conference room, once called the Red Hall, adjoining Lenin's office. Stalin eventually took over the total power and used it for 25 years. Yet we find here today no visible trace of Stalin's memory. The Seventh Communist Party Congress, which in 1918 approved the return of the capital from Petrograd to Moscow, approved a party program to make Russia a socialist nation. It remained for the successors of Lenin and Stalin to declare that program fulfilled. They built the new Palace of Congresses for the 22nd Party Congress, where a new program, From Socialism to Communism, was promulgated.
For the new leadership, the Kremlin is no longer a place of residence, but it is still the showplace of power. Among the most frequent visitors to the Kremlin are the cosmonauts, modern heroes, who, when they are not themselves the guests of honor, are in frequent attendance at the other celebrations, the political rallies and international meetings for which the new Palace of Congresses is used. For such affairs and for presentations of the performing arts, vast audiences may attend. There are 6,000 seats in the auditorium. General Vedenin has brought us back to the Grand Kremlin Palace, where two richly ornamental halls were remodeled into one large chamber to accommodate the Supreme Soviet. The leading party and government figures always appear at these benches for Supreme Soviet sessions, in which the government's actions are ratified. This hall also was the meeting place for Communist Party Congresses before the new palace was built. It was here that party members heard the first famous denunciations of the late Joseph Stalin during the 20th Party Congress. The severe plainness of this chamber is always a surprising contrast to the rest of the Kremlin. The general has proudly shown us the Kremlin inside and out, and as the genial host, returns us to the grand staircase where we began. Thank you very much again, General. The Kremlin gate nearest to the Grand Kremlin Palace is actually in the Borovitsky Tower, but tradition impels a visitor to choose the Spassky Gate. It takes us back to Red Square, Russia's masses still come to Red Square in the Kremlin, as in the time of Ivan the Terrible, of Boris Godunov, of Peter the Great. Patiently they wait in interminable lines. No longer at the doors of the ancient cathedral of St. Basil, but before a monument of red granite, housing a glass case with the remains of Lenin. Behind Lenin's mausoleum in the Kremlin Wall are buried the lesser heroes of the Bolshevik Revolution. Here are the ashes of John Reed, a newspaper man from Portland, Oregon, who became an early champion of the revolution. Ivan the Great looked far beyond the Kremlin walls. Today's rulers look much farther. To them, the Kremlin is the driving force of a tide that must one day, they claim, engulf all mankind. These graves reveal a dimension of Kremlin influence which no Tsar in history had dreamed. Much of Russia today and much of communism throughout the world still bears the stamp of one man's personality. He has been compared in the single-minded sweep of his ambition with Peter the Great, in cruelty with Ivan the Terrible. For a time after his death, 10 years ago, he lay in honor next to Lenin. Now he has been displaced to a humble resting place, still within the communist pantheon. It bears a simple inscription 
J.V. Stalin. Guard changes, the times change. But for the Russians, in the words of one of their contemporary writers, for us Soviet people, our Kremlin is not just ancient stones, not just a monument of Russian architecture. It is our history. Here in the Kremlin, you feel our today, our tomorrow.